Well, thanks everybody for joining us um, for this week's ANCO. ANCO is a, is a limited series, uh, limited discussion series about cities and COVID-19, uh, where we talk with friends and colleagues doing different work around the country to deal with COVID-19 as it's happening, adjust their patterns and their policies around it, and also just to generally talk about how we think it's going to shape the future of cities and, and urban areas uh, even after it's gone. And it's hosted by Yard and Company. Yard and Company is an urban growth firm. Uh, we do urban design planning and redevelopment strategy, strategies for cities and districts and neighborhoods uh, throughout the country. And we are joined today by some good folks from IOB, Jennifer Allen and Leslie Rich. Uh, IOB stands for In Our Backyards, for those of you who, who aren't familiar. Um, it is a, I'm gonna simplify it here, and I'm sure Jennifer and Leslie will, will add much more enriching details, but it's a crowdfunding platform that gives local leaders the ability to crowdfund resources within a community to create real positive, inclusive change uh, in their neighborhoods. And um, we, we're very familiar with IOB at Yard and & Company and have even um, worked with them on a couple of occasions and are really proud to have them on today and, and they do, they're doing wonderful work. So welcome, uh, Leslie and Jennifer, how are you guys? We're great, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks so much. So we always start with uh, kind of a fun little question of where are you? Um, both you know, in the world and in your house. And how, how have you settled into working from home? Jennifer, go first if you can. Sure. Um, I am in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I am in the corner of a room here um, within the apartment on the first floor. Um, so um, excuse any outdoor sounds that you hear. There is not central air in this building built in 1931. Um, so the window is open. But yeah, so, you know, Brooklyn is one of the hardest hit areas of COVID-19. So um, yes, day by day is kind of where I'm at. And you, Leslie? Uh, I am in Cincinnati, Ohio, and um, I'm uh, launching IOB in Cincinnati. And uh, where I've been working um, since the middle of March is uh, the office slash playroom that I share with my children, which is why you can see art supplies and a Star Wars poster behind me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're, it's, you're pretending it's your kid's room, but it's really your Star Wars poster. Is that what's happening? It's my it? husband's Star Wars poster, actually. Okay. It's an original. There you go. So, yeah. All of my fun work stuff you can't see. It's in front of me. So, yep. So... Let's start with kind of a, I, I touched briefly on, on IOB and, and what it is, but Jennifer, why don't you provide us with a little more detail on it, into how it works. Uh, we, I've never actually done an IOB project myself, but I, I got about 70% into one of the ones that got canceled. And um, I found it really fascinating how, um, how the process worked of raising the money and the tools you provided me in figuring out how to approach that. It was just a really interesting process. Do you want to just touch on that for a sec? Sure. So um, we are a national nonprofit crowdfunding platform, as Kevin mentioned. And that platform is actually both online, the actual website where you can have your crowdfunding campaign hosted where you can um, see a bunch of online resources, but it is also offline in the sense that number one, you get paired with a fundraising coach. And that's not, that's sort of what makes us a novelty in the world of all the crowdfunding platforms out there. Um, you get to work one on one with a person that gets to understand your work in general, what in particular you're crowdfunding for, um, what's your fundraising experience. Um, on and on, um, all of the different aspects of what it takes to um, do a successful campaign. So the way it works is you basically share your idea with us, you get paired with that fundraising coach, and then we're able to provide um, a very tailored sort of plan and strategy 
um, for you as you move forward. And what have you seen um, since this pandemic has broken out? Have you seen, you know, a decrease in interest or an increase? Have you seen a different type of user for different types of projects or how have you changed um, your approach kind of during this times? So um, <clears throat> I think most people from like the household um, and like individuals, part of a family up to companies, it's been a time of adaptation. And that is certainly what IOB has done. And we've really adapted to serve the groups that are sort of on the front lines. So that's really important to us, number one, because we have this value of like neighborhood led, um, resident led solutions, um, meaning like we believe that people on the ground know what's really needed. And so we exist to be a support to that work. And so some of the things that we have found to be really needed is, um, support for mutual aid groups. So these are groups that are like delivering groceries, getting people to doctor's appointments. Um, you know, government is not gonna be able to provide that fine grain detail of, of service, um, but these neighborhood groups can. And so we've adapted our platform to actually serve them, which means number one, they're often not nonprofit organizations, so they need a fiscal sponsor. And so we're able to provide that fiscal sponsorship for them. Um, typically, we do um, one disbursement of funds. You know, you have your deadline for your campaign, and at the end, we give you all of your money. But these are groups that are, you know, they have folks that need groceries today, tomorrow, next week. Um, they have um, hundreds of volunteers sometimes that are going to get these groceries for folks and then needing to be re, uh, reimbursed. And so we've made it such that we can get money to these mutual aid groups more frequently. Um, we're doing some experiments on how we can actually get money to their sort of super volunteers more easily. So that's just a, a, a realm of innovation that we've kind of um, opened the door to just so that we can be right next to communities as they're trying to get People the help that they need. So that's one example. Um, two quick um, other examples like direct cash assistance. So that's another thing. Sometimes people just need to give people 50 bucks to go towards their rent or whatever. Um, that has not been something we've done in the past. We now do that. And something that we've been working on is how can we get assistance to black owned businesses. So that's an example of one community that has um, been hit uh, particularly hard. And so, for example, we've been talking to Mortar, um, knowing how they serve black owned businesses and pose the question, what if you were a fiscal sponsor? And so anyone around the country could actually use you as a fiscal sponsor as they are crowdfunding with us. Um, another one, and Leslie's been working on this with United Way in Cincinnati, um, could we be the fiscal sponsor for some of their grantees um, that um, are working on black led ideas that address poverty and United Way is even looking into um, could they also provide match dollars to those grantees. So we're, right. we're really open to partnerships that really can address the most vulnerable, the, those that are most in need as a result of the pandemic. And so when you say, just really quickly, when you say fiscal sponsor, I just want to clarify for those who are listening, you're saying folks that just don't have a 501c3 or right. a, a platform to, to, to take money and hold it, correct? Right. So because IOB is a nonprofit organization and every donation raised on the platform is tax deductible, when we disperse funds, it needs to go to a 501c3 organization. But sometimes people are just a person on their block doing something for their community and they have no interest in becoming a 501c3 and they currently are not. And so the way to get around that is to have a fiscal sponsor. And sometimes people can find a church, another local nonprofit that's willing to do that for them. Um, but if not, IOB can provide that for them. Cool. That's great. So Jennifer, a lot of the stuff you talked about just now, I would imagine in some way is new territory for IOB or new applications for, you know, a model you guys have been um, developing. 
Leslie, for you as somebody who is kind of onboarding and establishing a new city for the IOB platform amidst all this change, amidst this period of time where new, new formats or applications for the funding are being developed, what has your experience been in uh, starting the, the local presence of IOB in Cincinnati amidst all this change? And, and what, what opportunities do you see in the months ahead to continue that innovation that Jennifer talked about? Sure. Um, so um, this has really helped us kind of think about how to be more creative in the way that we are engaging our neighborhood leaders, where right now I would typically be taking advantage of the relationships that I've built over the last 20 years of um, doing community organizing and community development work in Cincinnati um, and meeting face to face with people. We've really had to shift to other platforms um, and lean on our already existing partnerships and relationships a lot more deliberately. Um, and a lot of that has, has worked well. Um, but some of that magic in, of IOB does really happen in those one-on-one -on -one interactions. And so um, some of that takes a little bit longer to finesse. Um, but one of the things that we are exploring right now through a partnership is with Invest in Neighborhoods, where they've seen that there are um, several well-organized community councils when they're using the in-person model. But because of COVID and the need to shelter in place, uh, many community leaders um, do not have access to technology to conduct the normal community council business. Um, specifically Lower Price Hill and um, Evanston and some other of our community councils. And so we're working with them to talk about how can we um, partner with them where Invest serves as kind of the clearinghouse to engage different community councils to engage um, and increase that civic participation by connecting people with um, Chromebooks or iPads so that the um, really local grassroots work of neighborhood building is still continuing despite this. Um, and, you know, I think it's n what we're doing now in Cincinnati that's never going to replace those in-person interactions when we're able to go back to that, but it's an additive so that when um, we can be out again, this is just another like tool in our toolbox. And how have you either locally in Cincinnati or, or Jennifer, what, what you can see from your perch nationally, how is the platform kind of readily um, bridging the kind of isolating gaps that are created by COVID where we're all kind of holed up in our, in our houses, unless you're, you know, a frontline worker or an essential worker, how, how has the IOB model um, been used to overcome social isolation? Um, and how are people using the platform maybe in new ways to bring people together, albeit at six feet <laughs> or greater uh, apart? Have you seen any kind of particularly, particularly good examples? Sure, and Leslie, you might have um, a couple of project type or, or stories to mention too, but we've definitely seen people, number one, if they have existing programs where they do gather people, they are, figuring out how to do the online version of them. So having those community connections remains important and they are adapting to make that happen. Um, and those can even be new things where it's like, okay, well, let's have like um, some sort of like online concert or let's, you know, let's do a project to raise money to do certain types of parades through our neighborhood. So people are continuing to find ways to connect. Leslie, I don't know if you have any other project types to bring up too. Um, yeah, I mean, one that I think um, speaks to that safe connectivity and um, really understanding what a neighborhood needs. Um, there was a project um, that I think also really speaks to one of the IOB principles, which is small is big in Lower Price Hill, where they have um, a community store called Collective Goods. And um, that's first of initially was developed to address the food desert issue. 
Um, but then they saw that a lot of the households in Lower Price Hill were lacking those um, essential hygiene items to keep people safe during COVID. And so they had done a previous crowdfunding campaign with IOB and because of the success with that and the support that they saw, they came back and said, um, you know, we know that with this, this small amount that we're going to be able to ensure that our neighbors stay safe, that they're going to have those basic hygiene items. Um, they're going to get access to masks. They're going to get access to cleaning supplies to make sure that their homes are safe while they're spending more and more time in them, um, especially in Lower Price Hill, where um, it's a pretty densely um, um, packed area as far as housing, where people are living um, either several families in an apartment or just in multiple units where sometimes social distancing is hard. Having access to all of that is really important. That cleaning stuff is really important. Jennifer, are you, you know, you guys have funded, um, you know, I think of Memphis as an example. By the way, Tommy Pacello was our guest last week and he says hi. Um, but he, you know, you've done a lot of projects in Memphis that I would be kind of coined tactical urbanism, you know, street projects, bike lanes, um, crosswalks. And then we're starting to see, uh, or we're not starting, we are, we're in the middle of seeing open streets, slow streets, to allow for spatial distancing um, and, and, and cities and neighborhoods. Are you, are you seeing an increase in that kind of project type with, with these concepts around the country? Yeah, looking at um, the projects, our COVID projects that have come in over the last couple of months, I'm not necessarily seeing like that project type increase. Leslie, I don't know if you've seen um, that particular project type. I have not seen them show up just yet, but I actually had a conversation with um, a few of the neighborhoods in Cincinnati that have been cleared through the city government to do open street or are considering it um, about what it would look like to partner with us because you know traditionally they would have a lot more time to think about a process like this but this is an immediate need where iob can um you know quickly respond whereas through those traditional channels it's going to take a lot longer to access the funding that they need to to get that um the temporary barriers and the furniture and all of those things in place um, or just try out something new where um, it's a street that's closed off to cars um, and just trying some different things. So there is definitely an interest that I'm starting to see here in Cincinnati around that. Yeah, and that interest, it is definitely something to check in on to see if that increases. Like a lot of our projects, when I look at you know a sweep of them, they're really, really focused on basic necessities. And so I wonder now that um, communities are, are learning a little more about how to provide those basic necessities and um, cities and states begin to reopen if we do see this wave of great now we are spending even more time outside what does this mean for um, restaurants to be open and like using outdoor space for like their um, for their guests what does this mean for exercise um, what does this mean for transportation? So I think um, what Leslie is saying might be an indication of like, yeah, we will probably see more of those as, as we have more and more conversations. Yeah, I could definitely see, and we're seeing in some of our work even, um, a, a lot of pressure be applied to the community center commu um, network in a lot of communities, particularly in ones that have had to make hard budget decisions about which centers to keep open or which aspects of those centers to keep open. And we're starting to get the question a lot and, and be interested in your guys' thoughts on how like an IOB type platform could start to provide a bridge to reconceiving those programs in an outdoor, more spaced out way. And maybe are led by a, a broader coalition of people rather than just, you know, the two or three staff members that you know are watching over our kids or whatever like it's more of a community model that um you know i would think would line up well with an iob funding platform 
to you know fill that need for community centers that aren't being met right now yeah i mean we definitely always lift up our platform as a great like testing ground for innovation and there have been people in the past and i'm sure in the future that will use our platform for sort of like unsanctioned type experiments so sometimes you may not have um the government buy-in yet you may not have um even the channels to reach them especially in times like these and so you know if you want to start small and be like okay let's go to our block association and let's tinker with some idea on just a few blocks at once to see how that works and raise the money for let's say you need um, some barriers some very like lo-fi um, kind of things to use to do that sort of thing um, you know a small IOB campaign is a great place to start to just like prove like this is something that our residents want it actually worked and to kind of have like a proof of concept to keep scaling it up and so I think you know a community center was in need for that and maybe like the surrounding streets around that community center that definitely could be an opportunity to partner um, between neighborhood residents and an institution like a community center just start small and just see let let like the um, the public momentum build for that um, just by starting small That's great. Well, and bringing the good, you know, bringing kind of all that full circle to this, you, you all brought up Mortar, which is a, uh, a Cincinnati based nonprofit that works with low income and minority entrepreneurs. Um, you bring, bringing, connecting that to the streets conversation and thinking through, um, I know, you know, Eric, who's on the, on the call li listening in today, and I had a little bit of a conversation based on last week's um, podcast about the monetization of public space and you know how there's basically restaurants bars to, in order just to, to remain afloat have to have more space for seating so their customers can come but there's an equity issue there i think around who benefits from that and where um where districts and neighborhoods with resources can build that out and support that um, is IOB kind of a potential platform to think through that with in, in African American business districts or minority business districts that are don't necessarily have the big district management entity or the business improvement district, but need the exact same things that you know you see in, for example, an over the Rhine neighborhood here in Cincinnati. Yeah, I mean it depends on like what particular expertise this um, example business would use. I definitely think um, we would kind of talk um, through sort of the frame that I just mentioned, like this is a great place to like sort of experiment with something if you're just getting started. And then it's, de it's definitely within our value set that like equity is very, very, very important to us. So we always want to um, shine a light on projects that are moving equity work forward. So I guess it kind of depends on the particulars of what that business would need, but I think they would definitely find us as um, a platform that's aligned um, with their values and what they're trying to do. Leslie, I don't know if anything else came to mind um, for you for that question. Um, I think, you know, the there is definitely a lot of possibility in that. And I think really the only limit to our platform is that we are really focused on um, ensuring that the projects that use us to get resources to carry the project out are projects that serve a public good. And so, um, but we also know too that um, minority owned businesses have a harder time getting access to capital and that's why we have started to explore a relationship with mortar around um, national fiscal sponsorship for that very reason um, and seeing it as you know if there's a block in in cincinnati um, or nationally um, where 
it's primarily um, black owned businesses, then we as IOB have decided that is a public good because it is that whole block is tied up in the success of or failure of those businesses mm -hmm. and their ability to access capital. Right. right. Yeah. And I think, again, it depends on the particulars, but I think that's a good example of when you get sort of like at a block or district scale and can kind of talk to businesses and hear what financial and maybe land use and the different tools that are and are not available um, there could be there could be cause to say like wow based on what's available to us it really does make sense for us to crowdfund together to try to get some unrestricted funding that doesn't have us having to check all of these boxes jump through all of these hoops mm -hmm get maybe this first injection of dollars or get this first example pilot project done. Um, so those are the kind of conversations that are really exciting for us um, that uh, kind of can happen, I think, at, at a little bit more of a scale. And um, the other thing is like, like Leslie was mentioning, because we're a nonprofit and because every project has to provide public benefit, if your um, crowdfunding is an individual business, um, things can get complicated and that's why it, it can sometimes be just easier to have a fiscal sponsor. And that's why a partnership with Mortar and other groups like them can really um, kind of open the doors for working with even more um, businesses for us. Cool. Go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> No, that's a great answer. Uh, I think, yeah, I think there's a, my last thought on that is that there is a, you know, in a, di a mixed use district, when it's functioning well, everybody, you know, every, every, when, when everyone succeeds, when, e when each individual succeeds, everybody succeeds. But I think what, uh, what we're realizing in the pandemic is how important these, these district management entities are like CDCs who wake up every day helping with the marketing and helping with uh, the activations and the programming and, and on and on. And a lot of the minority districts and low-income neighborhoods just don't have that resource. So I think it's, it's really interesting what you said, Jennifer, around instead of one-off businesses kind of applying to build a parklet or whatever it might be, um, finding matching grants from a United Way and working with Mortar to look at a district comprehensively because I think in that in that environment, where you know there's just complex districts with retailers, restaurants, bars, coffee shops, it's just you know, the one-off approach. It worries me a little bit. Um, well, in any district, let alone whether it's a uh, one without a lot of resources or with. Well, and the value of this approach is, I think it begins to remedy. I think the rising concern that's starting to be talked about increasingly as we kind of, you know evaluate the world as it's changed around us around the severe amount of change or significant amount of change that's just happened as a result of the pandemic to push a lot of things through whether it's reallocating the street reallocating the sidewalk reallocating how businesses interface with their customers uh, lost in all that uh, partially because of the speed of response but also the difficulty of reaching people at this time has been the conversation as to what does it all mean? How does it impact me? Who is it for? Um, and as the dust starts to kind of settle and the world's in a slightly different order than maybe it was once before, uh, I could see the types of conversations that you all are sponsoring through the platform being instrumental in connecting all those dots. And so as we wrap up here, we, we try to keep this to about 30 minutes. As you kind of look up from your, your computers and, and think about you know, where the world is headed, this is dangerous territory I know, uh, pr uh, predicting the future in, in these times, but you know, historically to make these districts work, it's been a, a really tight collaboration between private households and businesses, public entities like the government uh, and nonprofits and family wealth philanthropic wealth in a community and they're all kind of working together in their own lane assignments 
in your work from where you sit, how do you see kind of moving forward? Is, is there is there a fundamental new uh, opportunity or responsibility of philanthropy, and maybe crowdfunding as an extension of that, um, in the kind of new normal? Yeah, I can start with this one. Um, both Leslie and I had thoughts about this question. I mean, one thing I thought about in the new normal, I really hope that philanthropy shifts to providing more multi-year grants with like less strings attached. I think that's great. Um, I definitely think um, we wanna keep improving our model because I think we are important in the ecosystem where people can raise unrestricted funds in a very flexible way that fits their timelines. I think that's important. And then, you know, we, again, we have this ethos that we really believe that neighbors know what is most needed. And so kind of along those lines, I hope that like newer models, kind of like the Boston um, Ujima project, it's kind of community organizing meets investment fund. So basically, if you consider a community organizing group for um, years and years and years has been working with residents to tell us what's the vision for your community, and then pair that vision with a fund um, with investors to make that vision a reality, um, I really hope projects like that continue to grow and like be replicated. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping just like you guys that this is like, the world of philanthropy is not going backwards, but actually going forwards. Yeah, and it, as a build on what Jennifer said, um, and um, Joe made a comment about um, philanthropic foundations really driving change sometimes. And um, one of the things that I am hopeful of is that this um, moment that we find ourselves in we are able to empower more citizen philanthropists where the everyday citizen sees their role in supporting change um, through small donations made again and again and again, because that's what we see on the IOB platform. Um, the average donation to a campaign is $45. And I think that um, neighborhoods and communities and cities in some cases have given a lot of their agency away to foundations when citizens really know what is best um, for their community. And if they are supporting it with their dollars, they're also going to support it with um, their time as well. And that just makes communities and cities stronger. And so it really, it, what I'm hopeful for is a ripple effect in civic engagement um, and citizen philanthropy. Well that's, well, that's that's great, guys. Um, I love the optimistic point of view. I think there's a sort of a feeling for me too out of the, during this that this idea of neighborliness, localism, um, supporting those closest to you, um, that hopefully comes out of this in the urban environment, and we realize that. Uh, whether it's a big developer, or big development, or a national chain, or I could go on and on, that the quick, the quick, easy ribbon cutting um, and the big catalytic project starts to take a little bit of a backseat to the smaller community-driven incremental growth right. that I think we all appreciate on this call. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for the time. We appreciate it. It was good to see you. Yeah, and you guys should check us out at iob.org slash Cincinnati. Find all the awesome projects that Leslie is supporting right there in Cincinnati. And then, of course, what we're doing around the country. Yeah, and we'll post a little follow-up on our website, and we can link to that. So we, we'll definitely do that. We appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, next week, we're going to be – we have a few of these left. And next week, we're going to be talking with Sean Suter uh, with Calfee Zoning a little bit about the future of – uh, regulations, red tape policy, and zoning, um, both during and after all this, and how it affects how uh, public entities think about how to regulate growth. So join us next week if you have the time. We'll be here. See you guys. Take care. Be well. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.